I'm Professor Thomas Reuter. I'm a trustee of WAS and I'm moderating this panel. And uh, welcome you all, panelists and audience alike. We have an incredible array of expertise and diversity on this panel as we discuss uh, in this 150-minute session um, the COVID pandemic and what it means to say that it is a systemic crisis and also perhaps to learn some lessons for the future given that the 21st century is likely to confront us with a number of other systemic crises. So what, are the what is the diversity of impacts of responses and also what are some of the policy failures in such situations? There are many lessons to learn and we want to depart a little bit from what uh, everyone might have heard here in the news every day. We have some different and unique perspectives from a very interdisciplinary group. There's no question that the COVID pandemic was the most important global event of 2020 and likely will be also of 2021, touching nearly all aspects of our lives. Commentary has focused primarily on the spread of the disease and public health measures in Western countries, while um, many other dimensions of the pandemic are rarely considered or only in expert circles. This session will examine the pandemic holistically from a multiple perspectives of experts from different fields who will share their analysis and insights with the aim of informing perhaps a more balanced policy and public debate. Um, because we, first of all, I would like to thank um, my um, co-organizers of this panel, uh, Fatwa El Gwindi, um, David Harris and Mike Marion, who are also uh, speakers. And I would like to thank Vaz for giving us a, a, a rather generous time allotment compared to other panels, but it is no doubt uh, the topic of our times. We have to maintain fairly strict discipline, um, and that means seven minutes for speakers. And we have also a number of invited guests who I will ask to speak later for about five minutes each before opening up to the general uh, audience. And uh, we will simply use uh, the uh, the uh, Q and A, uh, the, uh, the hand raising uh, um, function uh, after, once we open to the to the to the audience. So just raise your hand and we'll. Uh, ask you to speak. Okay, now I would would like to start with my own um, uh, presentation, uh, which is as as a way of introducing the panel. And um, my presentation is um, uh, about uh, the economic aspects. Now. The COVID-19 pandemic was a relatively indiscriminate crisis in terms of its direct impact because no population had any immunity to the virus. Notably, the, the group most exposed to infection risk in mid-April 2020 was the jet-setting international elite, which guaranteed that this crisis gained instant global recognition. Now, while the effectiveness uh, of public health measures and hence infection mortality rates varied across nations, the impression remained that COVID did not discriminate in the usual way. For example, we saw some relatively poor countries like Vietnam outperform rich countries like the US in fighting the virus. And to an extent, the greater usefulness of populations in the developing countries kept a lid on their mortality rates. But this, I argue, is a false impression. Like other crises, this pandemic is revealing and deepening an underlying crisis of inequality. And that's my, my topic. Disadvantaged popula populations everywhere soon were disproportionately affected. Unsafe workplaces for low paid workers, poor access to healthcare, and greater vulnerability to pre existing conditions led to higher exposure to infection and more fatal outcomes after infection. 
access to vaccines is also unequal. You might have heard that 80% of all doses for the first vaccine by BioNTech Pfizer were claimed by a few rich countries. And a similar pattern applies to most other vaccines. However, I would like to stress that these health-related differences pale in comparison with the differential economic impact of COVID. And it is here that the tragic consequences of inequality become fully visible. Most of all, economic disruption due to COVID has reduced the food security of millions of people. Food availability was hit in some places by disrupted production and uh, supply ch chains, but more often the problem was affordability caused by a, a sudden loss of employment or other income. Now, in the mainstream daily newspapers, you will look in vain for any leak table comparing the number of, of deaths across countries due to COVID-induced food insecurity. That kind of news is not seen as relevant to the elites and middle classes of wealthy Western nations who supply the, the worthy victims of the crisis. It is also not considered news because hundreds of millions of people have been food insecure even when we had a global food production surplus. And until 2014, we could hide behind the fact that their numbers were at least shrinking. But under COVID's economic impact, poverty is skyrocketing and additional hunger is set to kill more people than the virus itself. Allow me briefly to, to, to illustrate the nature and magnitude of this other indirect COVID crisis. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Around the world, people in low paid and unstable employment and without household savings were the most likely also to become unemployed and instantly food insecure, not to mention housing, education and health insecurity. The UN's World Food Programme estimates the number of people experiencing crisis level hunger rose to 270 million by the end of last year because of the pandemic, an 82% increase. Oxfam estimates that by the end of 2020, between 6,000 and 12,000 people died each day from hunger linked to the crisis. And this could go on for years. And in developed countries, two economic inequalities causing diverging COVID impacts. In the US, for example, 39% of those making less than 40,000 US dollars a year lost their jobs, 39%, compared to only 13% of those who earned 100,000 and more. Also women and young people were like, more likely to lose their job and their food security. And further fam uh, families of color were suffering disproportionately by well, a factor of two, double. Overall food insecurity in the US doubled in 2020 from 35 to 54 millions. Food banks and street kitchens ref reported sharp increases in demand. And while recovery for the poorest could take over a decade, America's 650 billionaires increased their net worth by, by 30% to 40 trillion US dollars during the pandemic. Distributing the wealth increase of the 10 richest billionaires alone would be enough to prevent anyone on earth from falling into poverty as well as pay for vaccinating every human being. Instead, this pandemic marks the first time since records began that inequality actually rose virtually in every country on earth at the same time. There are also, of course, inequalities in the national crisis response capability. Developing nations have larger proportions of workers in precarious employment who needed support and less reserves to pay for that. In India, for example, the state could not afford to provide income sub supplements on anywhere near the scale of the uh, 2.2 trillion US, uh, US dollar CARES Act, which the US Congress passed in March 2020. Though admittedly, uh, uh, it is not just a matter of means, but also political will. But what worries me about developing countries is that as of last September, 84% of the IMF's COVID-19 loans were encouraging and sometimes requiring countries to adopt austerity measures in the aftermath of the health crisis. You remember the uh, uh, GFC and, and what that meant, that those, those austerity measures. 
uh, that would entrench in inequality. Now, a, a recent ISC uh, report thus estimates that overall the number of lives threatened by acute levels of hunger, hunger is expected to double due to the crisis and 2021 may go down in history as a year, a year of famine on, on a scale that we have not seen for decades. What to do? Well, the World Bank has calculated that if countries act now to reduce inequality, then poverty would return to pre-crisis level, um, levels in just three years, and that's still quite a long time, perhaps longer than it will take us to master the virus itself. But if measures were taken, uh, are not taken, it would take a decade at least. And when it comes to disaster prevention at all levels, global, national, or local, I therefore argue that lowering inequality is the best preparation for crises of all kinds. Otherwise, in, in this crisis-stricken 21st century, inequality is set to, set to manifest a structural homicide, you might say, on a massive scale. The ideology that likes to call on each of us personally and on each nation to be responsible for our own resilience and disaster preparedness, when power and wealth and income are dis distributed so unequally is obviously flawed, but this ideology has long kept us from recognizing inequality reduction as a key instrument of disaster risk reduction. And yes, there is Plenty of hard evidence to prove that with sufficient political will, inequality can certainly be reduced. Let us on, insist on it, on solidarity, not COVID-induced hunger games. And it will benefit us all. As Pope Francis put it, and I will close with that quote in his recent, from his recent work, Fratelli Tutti, Brothers All, the notion of every man for himself will rapidly degenerate into a free for all that will prove worse than any pandemic. Okay, with that, I, I close my introductory talk and um, I, I hand over to the first, the next speaker, uh, my colleague Mike Marion, um, who uh, is the senior principal security of the security and sustainability gui guide and a VAS fellow. Mike, over to you. I'm not a public health specialist or an epidemiologist. Rather, I'm a future-oriented, non-denominated social scientist who leans towards political science. I'm interested in many decades in what's happening, uh, what may happen and what should happen. The COVID-19 pandemic is the primary concerns what's happening uh, everywhere right now with uh, uh, climate disasters and political conflicts temporarily taking center stage in certain places. For the past year, I've been trying to get an overview of the COVID situation and you can check it out at uh, the uh, S SSG website securesustain.org. I also have a brief version in the latest issue of, of Cadmus. It's no easy matter because there's a torrent of changing information on many fronts to consider and the focus keeps changing. Uh, Paul Collier, uh, the development uh, expert at uh, Oxford University in last April said that the current epidemic is a classical ap application of radical uncertainty which guides our thoughts to facing known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And also, uh, which of the known onks, which I'll call them, matters most. So to get a grip on the COVID onks, I'm sketching a provisional transdisciplinary framework of 10 major uncertainties in three broad categories. Uh, the undercounting of confirmed cases and deaths, the adequacy of vaccines and other treatments, and global impacts and response. All of this will be crammed into five remaining minutes. I realize that swinging through the treetops leaves a lot unsaid that you may be quite familiar with many of the unks that I may, what I say may be questioned or become obsolete in a few weeks or months. Nevertheless, I proceed. First, global <clears throat> uh, in infections and, uh, and deaths uh, the undercount. The cases are undercounted due to inadequate testing, a variety of tests, and political suppression enabling rulers to look good or less bad. 
Number, uh, number two, death undercounting. A better estimate can be had from actuarial expected deaths based on a previous five-year average are contrasted with actual actual deaths. Uh, now, case in point here is uh, the state statistical agency in Moscow announced that the death toll from COVID-19 is more than three times as high as officially reported. Uh, I'm sure that the statisticians got a nice one-way tickets to Siberia for that one. The third onk, and this is a, a big one, as we know, is new mutations or what are called variants. Uh, the, no, one, known, the knowns are right now from the UK, South Africa, and Brazil, now spreading in dozens of countries. Uh, but also you have to consider there will very likely be more variants in, in, the, in the future. In the US, the UK, uh, dub, uh, the variant is doubling every uh, 10 days and will soon become the dominant strain in a couple months. The fourth unknown is uh, the, the long haulers, uh, first uh, also called people with long COVID, people who survive, but they're ser seriously uh, afflicted with a variety of debilitating physical and mental uh, symptoms. Uh, relatedly, for the billions who have not had COVID, there's still mental health issues of anxiety, depression, and going bonkers from quarantine, lockdown, social isolation, and pandemic fatigue. Uh, also, a new development uh, or a concern is uh, stress and more booze and snacks will increase heart disease, which is the leading cause of death, at least in the U.S., and that this will show up in the next year or two. Okay, the second major category is the vaccines and treatments. Uh, UNC number five is vaccine availability and distribution. Nine vaccines are now available with a couple hundred more in various stages of development, but distribution is still erratic and variable within and between uh, countries. The demand at present is far greater than the supply and the vaccines have different efficacy rates and success against the variants. Unknown number six is the anti-vaxxers. Uh, they vary in intensity uh, within and between countries. China has the highest willingness for a jab at around 90%, but uh, France is less than 50% and Russia 38%, which doesn't bode well for herd immunity, which is estimated at 80%. The uh, IAP March 23 global webinar on vaccine hesitancy uses an overly mild word in its title. Many people are not merely hesitant, but strongly against vaccination for any sort of health reasons, specious or not, religious beliefs, and anti-big government hostility. Unknown number seven, uh, <clears throat> hospitals and equipment. Many people in rural areas of poor countries do not have ready access to hospitals, which may not have sufficient ICU units, ventilators, or oxygen. Uh, for example, in Manaus, Brazil, and Mexico. Uh, have problems with oxygen. Treatments are improving, however, that are lowering death rates. Uh, unknown number eight, the medical staff and PPE. The heroic doctors and nurses are overwhelmed, overworked, and often infected due to inadequate PPP. Also, you have to consider nursing home staffs, coroners, ambulance drivers, and janitors. Global impacts and response. The, the biggest one is much more inequality within and between countries. Uh, large and small businesses, especially the uh, small businesses are closing and, pe and people in the informal economy between rich and poor people and between men and women. In the US, among workers who had to leave the labor force to attend to at-home children, some 85% were women. Women are also the large majority of at-risk health workers. In sum, the key uncertainty is how much inequality uh, global leadership must recognize huge inequalities and uncertainties created by COVID, arguably doubling, perhaps tripling, the many existing inequalities that SDG number 10 seeks to reduce. There's a possibility of post-pandemic boom similar to the 1920s uh, discussed by Bloomberg Businessweek and The Economist. But this is not, uh, not, like, not necessarily likely. I can't get into the reasons now. But then there's the new normal of revised thinking about security, especially health security and pandemics, which may lead to broader thinking about human security 3.0, which David Harry's 
will describe in the parallel necessity to deal with worsening climate change and transformations needed to meet or approach the SDGs. Uh, but this expanded rationality or global progressivism cannot be taken for granted. It will require an extensive political effort and new forms of communication. In sum, we must hope for the best, but anticipate and plan for the worst. It is easy to hope, however, but difficult to plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, um, Mike. That's uh, very, very interesting. I think we, uh, what, what I think is striking uh, is that, you know, here we are, we, you know, we're hearing a, a scientist talk about COVID and what you are laying out is a whole long list of uncertainties and unknowns. And I think uh, the public too has had to face the fact that science doesn't always have the answer ready at hand, that it is a process. And to my surprise, the reputation of science has actually grown because I think the public's learned a lot about the scientific pro uh, process itself and that it is a learning process. Nevertheless, those uncertainties, of course, are uh, very difficult to live with. Okay, I now invite uh, Stefan, Dr. Stefan Brunhofer Huber to, to speak. Uh, Stefan is a trustee of the World Academy. He's also a medical director at Diakonie Hospital in Germany, so right at the call face of things. Stefan, are you there? Um, thank you very much again for uh, addressing this topic. I'm just listening to the previous speakers. There's one way to speak about um, COVID from a case-to-case -case perspective in a clinical setting. I'm running a hospital with 700 patients, uh, uh, kind of ground zero. The other thing is, as you mentioned, is talking about the systemic issues coming out of this crisis. The way I look at it is um, that I perceive this COVID crisis as an asymmetric external shock systemically. You know, we had internal shocks like banking crisis, like uh, the 2008 crisis, but this is different. This is, for me, it's an asymmetric external shock that hits us in an unfair way, as you mentioned. It hits us in a subtle way. We cannot see it, this virus. It hits us globally, and it causes a form of disruption we have not experienced in the past. And um, if you look at data with regard to pandemics, it's one out of three asymmetric shocks we can expect in the near future. One is pandemics it's itself. We have the data that we can expect within the next 10 years, statistically between eight and 10 epidemics of similar size, not pandemics, but epidemics, viral epidemics, um, to the one we're experiencing now. The second is global warming, and the third is biodiversity loss. They have a similar, they're all external shocks to the system. What I'm experiencing during the entire last year is globally something that I called a global mental preparedness for change. We have never experienced in our human lifetime, maybe even for centuries, that the entire globe, the entire human spaces gets in a mindset for synchronized preparedness for change. I'm not saying that we're changing, but we have the preparedness for change. And this preparedness for change is seen from a clinical perspective, from a psychiatry, uh, something we know in psychiatry itself, the preparedness for change is a precursor for the real change. So if you look at this COVID crisis from a systemic perspective, I think we should differentiate between two forms of governance. One is we continue business as usual and adapt the current rules and maximize the rules to its best, or we change the games of the rules, the rules of the games. You know this puts the entire government discussion on a different level. And if we do so, we might end up differentiating a society where on one side we have an increase of efficiency and on the other side we have an increase of resilience. And we have to find 
the momentum on top of this where we have to give in a little bit of efficiency and have to invest more in resilience. So from a systemic perspective, I see that we have to head towards an economy of resilience, which implies four aspects, economically speaking. The first one, we are entering a new phase of risk analysis. This is the entire debate about total cost analysis, internalizing costs. Currently, we're still externalizing social environmental spillovers. We have to internalize that. The second one is comes out as a consequence is regionalization. Globalization is not a means to its end. It's a purpose for something else, for wealth, for well-being, for welfare. So if we overstretch globalization, we have to find forms of regional economies. The third R is regionalization, uh, sorry, regulation. We need more and other forms of regulating the system. And the fourth R is reshaping human behaviors. So risk, regionalization, regulation, and reshaping human behaviors are the four components which might be important to consider if we are moving from an economy of increased and maximized efficiency towards an economy of increased and maximizing resilience. Let me say one more sentence. Uh, just before Christmas, the UN HDI, Human Development Index, got be updated. You can read it, you can down, download it. And what, you, what we can learn is COVID has been causing a backlash in the HDI by 10 years. So we yeah. lost to COVID in all parameters, 10 years. So what's required mm -hmm. is definitely not austerity, but a huge stimulus program, but a stimulus program different than all the stimulus we did in the past. Okay, now I'm finishing. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's exactly the same, uh, you know, what a point I was making earlier, you know, it'll take 10 years to recover. Um, it's a 10 year setback, especially for poverty reduction and hunger reduction. And, uh, you know, the recovery in those countries that don't have the resources uh, to create helicopter money, uh, who have to borrow from the IMF, uh, uh, it'll be very difficult. And uh, there's a lot that needs to be considered there uh, for the benefit of the entire global economy. But uh, I must hand over now to David Harris, who uh, has also worked with Mike on the Security and Sustainability Guide for the World Academy, uh, and who's had, uh, you know, a background in security with Parkwash Canada and so on. David, over to you. Morning from Kingston, Canada, Canada's first capital. Uh, I heard first the word human security, the term human security in 1974. It was at a force commander's meeting at the United Nations force in Cyprus in the second day of the Turkish invasion of the country. It was an emergency meeting. Ever since then, I've been viscerally connected and committed to human security. And that's been reinforced by personal experiences in three wars and enabled by the formal establishment, of course, human security and the United Nations Development Program, Human Development Report, 1994. But I've been disappointed more often than not. As much as many have worked in the mainstream to mainstream the issue, it has never been more than a complimentary one even during two periods of significant attention. These I title Human Security One and Human Security Two. Human Security One during the late 1990s and early 2000s had its high point around the time of the publication of the Human Security Report 2005 and Canada's foreign policy based on human security, freedom from fear and want. In that time frame, I was actively involved in human security with five organizations and produced and taught a full master's course at the Royal Military College of Canada for students, excuse me, all over the world. Most of the members of the Middle Powers Initiative were involved at that time. Now, probably the 2008-2009 Great Recession or whatever it was called, put a little bit of a break on that. But for me, the biggest issue was in that period of time, human security one, 
not one of the other major security and well-being initiatives mentioned here in security, not the Millennium Development Goals, not the responsibility to protect, not the Global Compact, not John Ruggie's UN Framework for Business and Human Rights. Human Security too. I think the high point was around the release of the United Nations General Assembly's A65685, which provoked Human Security First campaign. But globally, human security remained of marginal interest. You'll note that none of the 17 SDGs mention the term. And I've had no luck getting answers to my emails to the Secretariat of the SDGs at the UN. Of course, the Donald Trump election and the presidential performance over four years did little for any global issue. And already apparent consequences of his and other leaders' role as Freedom House and others have noticed is a significant decline. So I have a fear. I fear that we, the royal we, humanity, are going to fail to exploit the opportunity primarily but not totally imposed by COVID-19. Humanity is threatened by a convergence of mutually reinforcing crisis we've heard about off and on virtually all these past two days. The pandemic is only now the most acute. There's the chronic, frequent and costly consequences of global warming, the continuing scourge of weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear, but also now bio and cyber. And plus there's a churn of several worsening social epidemics. And we've talked about the inequality, mental distress, opiate induction, uh, addiction, domestic violence, and unevenly deficient learning opportunities. In addition, much of conventional wisdom is in shambles. I've identified 32 long-held assumptions that have been assassinated by COVID-19's arrival, the responses to it, and the evolving consequences. All to say that there never before has been an opportune, more opportune time to address a long developing and now screaming need to rethink security. Again, my fear is that we're gonna waste it. Therefore, I have a message. Human security must be rebranded humanity security. Humanity security, now. This is my human security three. I have a major essay underway on this whole issue. And it's going to emphasize the fact that security needs to be more than just of and for humans, but of and for overall planetary well-being. For air, land, and oceans healthy enough for all living things to occupy without fear or want. The security of humanity cannot be allowed to follow human security one and human security two as an issue on the margins. Humanity security must set the margins for all action now. Therefore, my suggestions. Remember Einstein? The definition of, ins of insanity is to continue doing the same thing again and again while expecting different results. And reframe a bit what the Russell Einstein manifesto ordered. I say, remember your humanity. There is nothing else. The WASP call in its introduction to this summit is for catalytic strategies. Oh, well and good. As long as their catalyst is strategic foresight, which has been called for a number of times in the past two days. If not, the impact of these strategies will be more likely to promote building back rather than building forward. Forward for a future that, unfortunately, Stefan has just said, probably includes other new viruses. My strongest suggestion is that the youth of WASP formally take the lead in designing and operating a foresight process for informing preparations for what is, after all, their future. Fourth main suggestion, establish at the United Nations, a United Nation, an undersecretary general for the SDGs. Be a small step in the journey to needed structural reform of the UN, which has often been called for the past two days. But more important now, it would demonstrate that we are serious about the 17 SDGs by situating humanity's attention to them in the front office of the preeminent globally mandated institutions. Five, establish interoperability as the protocol guiding collaboration, not integration. Silos so often pilloried, even this week, will not go away. And they're not all bad. As we have heard, homogenization makes little sense, especially for an organization trumpeting unity and diversity. But silos do need renovation, so their occupants can see, hear, speak, and share, share knowledge with those in other silos. This is one of the formal purposes 
of the security and sustainability guide. Our goal must always be progress, not solutions. Wicked problems do not solve. Seventh, think leadership, leadership. Experts and bosses, however revered, must not be allowed to continue to monopolize leading and how it is done. The two youth panels yesterday made the case for this change eloquently. My conclusion, humanity and its planet are one system of systems, each and all complex and dynamic. It's either humanity security for all or human security for none. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yes, I think uh, the concept of human security is definitely a central issue in this. And uh, if you think of the alternatives, the, the sort of more traditional ideas of security through military might or economic might, which is often closely correlated, it is that kind of race to the bottom that I, I mentioned at the end of my paper too, you know, this, this uh, free for all and, uh, you know, that is not going to work because I think, as you rightly said, humanity is prospered. When it has prospered, it is because of our capacity to cooperate more than any other species. Now, um, ask uh, my dear colleague, Fatwa El Gwindi, who is a fellow anthropologist and a vast trustee as well. Uh, she's worked at the University of California, but her background is uh, from Egypt and she's also worked in the Middle East, and that's the perspective uh, she brings. And uh, over to you, Fatwa. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning, good evening. In her Miracle of Morning, Amanda Gorman wrote, while we might feel small, separate, and all alone, our people have never been more closely tethered. The question isn't, if we can weather this unknown, but how we will weather this unknown together. We are what we are because of social cultural properties and flexible cognitive abilities and togetherness is a central feature of humanness. When the Italians went out to their balconies when they were asked to quarantine they started singing opera loudly as if they are calling for the whole world that we are there. Neighbors responded with opera singing. But not only that, the whole world responded when the image went viral on social media. This is a very human reaction against enforced isolation, seeking togetherness. But this togetherness was very Italian. It was a cultural response. When in New York City, somebody tried to imitate that when they saw it on, uh, on uh, social media, he was shouted down by the neighbors and asked to shut up. Another striking example comes from Egypt. When public health officials were isolating infected households in rural areas in order to enforce quarantine, they were confronted by tens and tens of relatives rushing from surrounding villages to the home of the infected to provide support, hugs, food to the infected. These are spontaneous social reactions grounded in cultural tradition. Officials rightly try to sanitize operations and procedures by isolating. But people also rightly spontaneously insist on togetherness. Let me go over a few points within my remaining allotted time. Uh, first, the unique human cognitive capacity provides humans with a sociality of togetherness and with generative creativity, imagination, and flexibility. Second, human communication is not simply speech utterances. With masking and distance, we are missing the smile, the touch, the gesture, the warmth, the anger. 
which reduces a social interaction to a transaction devoid of human quality. Third, in 1946, the World Health Organization defined health holistically as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. Thus, this definition linked the physical, the medical, the emotional, the social, and as I have demonstrated with two cross-cultural examples, the cultural. Fourth, systematic research must abide by rigorous standards. Rigor takes time. The review itself, the investigation process itself takes time. Subjecting the uh, research to scientific peer review takes time. Publishing in high impact factor scientific journals takes time. People don't understand that. They, they treat sometimes, they look at science as magic. But often, business and politics seek quick fixes. The World Academy must discourage policies based on quick fixes. Fifth, the pandemic is global, and so the vaccine must be globally administered with equal accessibility. Vaccine nationalism and racism is mixing health with politics, and business is linking health to profit. This erodes the trust of the people in the vaccine and contributes to inequalities that are already structural in the systems, as was said by Thomas and others. Prior to the pandemic, we had these inequalities. The pandemic is just exposing these inequalities and showing us how big a challenge it is when we're not prepared, when we allow these inequalities to grow. Sixth and final point, the pandemic must be linked conceptually to sustainability and practically. A point I argued in my publication on sustainability in the Arabian Gulf. Sustainability is about seeking participation of real people, not stakeholders, real people toward real solutions grounded in real lives. It's possible, but we have to put an effort to do it. In conclusion, and with apology to Amanda Gorman, I offer my own humble words, which I call miracle of humanness. While the pandemic keeps us masked and isolated, our mind is of capacity not to be underrated. Humans evolve to imagine and connect. So we zoom across the world to reflect. Thank you. Thank you, Fadwa, uh, for reminding us that we really are, uh, according to, you know, it's quite a bit of research to back up this claim that we really are a hard wire to, to respond to injustice. We don't like it. We've programmed to dislike injustice we, because of our, uh, uh, evolution as a species in small communities. And of course, you know, we talk about systemic crisis, but there isn't one system, there is the global system, and it is in a way one, but in another sense, it's also nested and they're different cultures. And whatever crisis hits us, it, it hits us where we are and as who we are in very specific ways and our resources differ, we have to take that into account and empower people to respond as best they can with what they have and with perhaps a little help from their friends elsewhere. Okay, now um, I'm going to hand over now to Saulo uh, Jose Casale Bahia from Brazil. He's a federal judge. Um, and uh, of course, Brazil, you know, has been a very special case when it comes to COVID and Salo will be able to tell us a little about that. Over to you, Salo. And uh, of course, Salo is also a trustee of VAS, I forgot to mention, sorry. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. I'm also a professor of constitutional law and international law at the Federal University of Bahia. And it's an honor to stay here in this huge, this fantastic event. And uh, stay here too in this panel with uh, you, Thomas, and Fadu. I would like to, to thank the invitation. And so my, my first word words are uh, economics deals with uh, scarcity, scarcity of uh, res resources. And the government deals with economics. And uh, my point in my presentation, my contribution that I believe will be to the debate is if scarcity is removed from the higher out horizon assessed by individuals in a society. There are spaces for governments to promote the distribution of their resources, surplus, and others, uh, needs of uh, less fav favor favorite social groups, or create situations of more social equality. And I would like to call this kind of government, or this kind of posture, as a promoter of solidarity. But when the, this surplus resources diminish or there is a risk to individual wealth, employment, access to scarce goods, the governments are sought to ensure stability for the status quo. And it's now important to the government preserve, to maintain, to protect, uh, even, for instance, uh, controlling immigration to guarantee domestic employment for nationals, even creating physical walls like in the United States and other countries. And I would call this posture, this kind of government, as individualistic. And we can do a generalization now we are speaking about left-wing and right-wing governments. Brazil nowadays is the right-wing wing government. Left-wing uh, governments tend to be linked with the idea of fraternity, solidarity, acting through social reform. But uh, right-wing governments are often attached uh, to an emphasis on security, and individual protection acting through individual development as a basis for the social development. And it depends of the moment, the circumstances experienced by each country. There is no right or wrong about it. And COVID-19 pandemic found countries which left-wing or right-wing governments are present and the policy adopted in each country varied according to the internal political spectrum possessed by each country. So governments were forced to enact lockdowns. They adopted unpopular measures with a high economic cost, potentially generating employment and loss of income. And uh, this idea is solidarity, common sacrifice, uh, even initiatives to for the approval of taxes on larger fortunes uh, take place, took place, wealth tax, Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, some North American states where Democrats predominate. But the governments with an individualistic bias anticipated uh, the, the, the unpopularity of measures of social isolation and lockdown. It's a political calculation. When they put themselves against the lockdown and for the market, for the economy, they bet with the fear of loss of jobs and incomes. So the government uh, wants to guarantee the position of leader of the population stand by, side by side with the majority and minimize the risks of COVID-19 is very useful for that. Uh, the, this kind of government ignores 
the severity of that damn the trumpets, the ability to face it, even with the use of uh, drugs of very controversial clinical efficacy, such as ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, indicates that it will be inevitable. Everyone will contract, most will suffer, some will die, and this is the life. Or minimize the risks, even with the leader showing in public the deliberate absence of the use of the protective individual masks. Uh, in addition, they, they always try to participate in agglomerations and so on to show that they don't have fear and the market has to win over the pandemic. Protection masks in some countries became uh, an external identification sign of the ideological position of the politician, right or left. See the United States when Democrats carry it and Republicans did not. The negationism in relation to the vaccine is directly related to the negationism in relation to the pandemic. Individualist governments are hesitant to adopt effective and quick measures, and they are criticized for that. Negationism government insisted on speeches about the existence of unwanted side effects with vaccination. My president here in Brazil declared that he will not take the vaccine to avoid transforming himself into an, an alligator. And it's very funny because uh, who took it, the, the vaccine, who took Instagram, Facebook, his face with an alligator face. I took the vaccine, I, I, I'm now an alligator. It's very funny. And uh, they incented the drug regulatory agents, our national regulatory agents, drug to demand uh, rigorous tests on the effectiveness of the vaccine. And uh, even if the vaccine is or, or are always approved by, by the American agency or European agency and so on. Well, and we started with a conflict between the, the, the executive power or branch and the judiciary and the, with the legislative. And we started with a, a great uh, politicization of the, the fight against the Brazil in some countries like Brazil, so in the United States too. Well, there is in summary a real political systemic crisis regarding the fight against the pandemic. I, I, it's a small exercise of political science I learned uh, a match with my, my professor Negan. It's my contribution today. Thank you by your attention. Thank you, Thomas. It's my contribution Thank you. today. Thank you very much, Saulo. That's a very important point you made about the uh, way ideology has interfered, you know, with, with, with our, you know, economic thinking, for example, you know, making us forget that um, the, uh, the, the redistribution or the distribution of resources from where they are scarce to where they are, from where they are abundant to where they are scarce is the ultimate function of an economy. And it would be good to remember that sometimes. It's not, not really about profit, but it's about maintaining a system. Uh, it's, that's the first, first rule. The system must be maintained, you know, through... Uh, a meaningful exchange, and also how political ideologies uh, led to these absolutely stunning outcomes, you know, like the politicization of mask wearing, which is yeah. really, it's, it's hard to comprehend. It's such, what's political about a mask, but well, you know, everything can be politicized. If you have polarized societies, where, uh, you know, the kind of politics that is sold is not rational policy-based, program-based, but identity-based, where, you know, uh, politicians sell identities. And um, that's why I say someone, you know, like, like Donald Trump, you know, has such loyal uh, uh, followers. It's not that you can't do anything wrong because it's not about right and wrong. It's about identity. It's about belonging. And that sort of thing is going to really make it difficult to have an effective response to any crisis. Yeah, I, I try to understand the causes of this behavior. 
yeah. and Brazil is very similar uh, with the United States at this moment, or, or with the Trump government was very, very similar. Indeed, the, the parallel has been drawn, indeed. Okay, but we must move on. I'll hand over now to another colleague, fellow anthropologist, uh, Vesna Vucinic from the University of Belgrade, uh, and uh, also a vast fellow. Uh, Vesna, you're, 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 the stage is yours. So, uh, the title of my small contribution is East West Cooperation in Resolving the Problem of COVID 19 Pandemic. If COVID-19 pandemic is a global problem, it, it should have been approached globally. Instead, we see increased geopolitical, especially West-East confrontations. Analysis of the behavior of the world powers points to the fact that they remain competitors in this global crisis. The Western powers are waging war against China and Russia. No matter whether it is about political, economic, or ideological reasons, the Cold War seems to have returned. One question stands out. Is it possible to resolve the common problem or not on the global level? Taking the anthropological point of view, I will try to pinpoint the problems that underline the present lack of East-West cooperation, according to my view. Problem one. Cultural and ideological intolerance. The West absolutizes its own culture and ideology. That is, it disregards other cultures and ideologies. When I say ideology here, I refer to both ideologies of political economy and religion. Uh, the pandemic has shown that neoliberally oriented societies are incapable of resolving serious health problems as opposed to the societies with socialist characteristics. Also, the Western world as a whole has shown that they do not want cooperation with the Eastern world due to embedded ideological and cultural barriers they are not able to overcome. Problem two, selective history. Selective memories written into official histories and popular culture are infused with stories and images of wars and other confrontations between countries that are aligned with the Western and Eastern bloc. These stories are nested way back into the time of the great migration of nations uh, from Asia to Europe from the fourth to the eighth centuries, roughly, and the Mongol invasion of Europe during the China's Yuan dynasty, 13th century. Yet the West forgets their conquests in Asia, such as colonialism imposed by Great Britain, France, the Netherlands, etc. For example, the opium wars, which imposed import of this deadly drug to China and the destruction of Beijing and other cities are omitted from these histories. Problem three, interventionism of various forms, military, political, economic, and cultural. This is probably the largest problem of today's world. It is based on either claims to territories and resources of former colonies, or the pretensions of the powers that have not had colonies to establish them in novel ways. It happens on regional, but also global levels by the most powerful Western countries. Intervention into internal problems of sovereign states which is so widely present, needs to cease. Problem four, communication breaches. Communication between countries occurs on different levels. It comprises a combination of formal and informal channels for potential dialogue. These channels are available in the domains of high level politics, diplomacy, military, economy and commerce, science and technology, culture, newspaper and TV media, social media, and indirect personal contacts. It is very important that information flows through all the named channels and in both directions, but especially between the governments. The, absent, uh, the absence of dialogue and the wall of silence allow the flow of disinformation. The states should act as partners with common responsibilities 
in the common Euro-Asian and world context. Now, problem five, disparities in the national health systems. The present uh, pandemic reveals unequal capacities of Western and Eastern states to deal with national level health crises. The Western countries are trying to prove to their citizens that it is not because of the ineptness of their political economy that they were not well cared for during the COVID pandemic, but that this is due to the malignant influence of the enemy from the East. They cannot tell their citizens that their neoliberal system did not provide an adequate healthcare system nor infrastructure for pandemic health crises, including the provision of the vaccine. To conclude, the absence of East-West cooperation is destructive for humanity, thus unacceptable and even absurd. The international relations should be anthropologized, as well as viewed from factual, historical, and geographic perspectives. We should remember that East and West, North and South are strongly interconnected Europe and Asia are part of the Euro-Asian continent. The same is true with other continents. Take Africa and Asia, South and North America, as well as Asia, Europe, and Africa, as some of the examples. They touch each other by landmass, but also by common histories and cultural exchanges. Thank you, is all. Excellent, Vesna, uh, you, you're ahead of time. and. I think uh, Great. what you've just uh, conveyed to us is in, in a way a sort of uh, connects with David's earlier statements about human security. And in a way, what you show is why uh, we don't have a global consensus on uh, human security because of these barriers of, of, of ideology, ideology or you know, this battle of systems, uh, you know, harkening back to the, the Cold War the differences in culture and historical consciousness uh, in, in different approaches to say the fundamental problem of power. How do you, how do you uh, resolve the, the problem of power in a society? Meaning uh, how do you prevent uh, uh, some people from monopolizing it? How do you, how do you consult? How do you uh, have a, a, a functioning political economy, there's more than one way to solve that problem. There are hundreds of different ways. If you look across the, the rec on the record of, you know, cross-cultural solutions to that problem, there's so many. And, and yet there are some universals on which a, a concept of human uh, security can be built, but these barriers are very serious. And, and like I say, uh, in a way nonsensical, we cannot afford these kinds of games anymore. We cannot afford uh, to act in a crisis as if, you know, as if we didn't, we were, we, you know, uh, we could survive individually. We can't do that. We can't have a race to the bottom. And uh, I think you, you really made it clear that, you know, the, what the barriers are. And I thought it was itching to, com uh, to, to comment, but we're not, no, we're not but really in the discussions, but very short, very short, Fatwa. Very short. I relate to what Vesna said, of course, because if you recall, I mentioned vaccine nationalism and racism, uh, the Russian vaccine and the Chinese vaccine is talked about in the United States in a very yeah. sarcastic yeah. way when yeah. you go on in social media. And I keep um, sending messages. I want the Russian vaccine. I, I have a choice of democracy. I want the Russian vaccine and they <laughs> tell me you have two choices. Uh, and um, th th this vaccine nationalism and racism, East-West idea that Vesna brought about, is important because some people in the security discussion are concerned about uh, the resistance to vaccines. The resistance to vaccine has to do with the politics of vaccine nationalism and the disinformation about it so that you go for Pfizer or for particular uh, companies. Um, it is, uh, as you said, Tom, it's very serious. And I think we 
always address it in a sanitized way. It has to be okay. brought out mm -hmm. that this yeah. exists, and in my opinion, it's not going to go away. So All we'll right. the World Academy so can do something. Thank you. Um, but I must uh, hand over now to, to Winston Nagin, uh, yet another trustee of the World Academy and uh, uh, chairman of the board emeritus. Uh, Winston is from the legal profession, very uh, 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 great rec record in human rights uh, and will have, I think his contribution will nicely fit in right here. Winston, over to you. Thank you very much for your generous introduction. I've uh, benefited enormously from all the erudite presentations here. And I was left with what else is there to say? Uh, I have a few thoughts. So let me start out with uh, a very simple idea. Uh, if we say there is a human right to healthcare, the question is, what do we mean by right? The people who wrote the UDHR had a sort of colloquial common sense meaning which they attached to the word right, and I thought it was self-evident. Uh, the problem is that as a technical matter, I'm a legal academic, the word right has been shown to mean eight different things. So <laughs> if you're trying to figure out what exactly is meant by uh, health and human rights, the eight different things that you have to figure out, okay? And those would still have to be extrapolated. Now, the guy that did this was a Yale professor by the name of Wesley Nuke Mohfeld, and he wrote a famous book all of the American restatements of the law sanctioned by the Supreme Court of the United States are written within the framework of this Hofeldian system, okay? The extrapolation of the different meanings of the terms rights. In a nutshell, uh, uh, the rights come as dual correlatives and dual opposites. So a dual correlative, if I have a right someone owes me a duty. That's the correlative. The opposite, the dual opposite, if I have a right, someone else has no right, you see. Now, there, there are eight different ways in which we can extrapolate that, but the, all that means is, is that there's a great deal of inclarity as to what we mean by the Declaration of Human Rights. So, I've written on most of these. Some of these are fairly self-evident. Mm. You want to define torture? That's quite easy to do, and then you can extrapolate it without too much complexity. But human, but healthcare is a maelstrom of complexity. You see, and, and, and so that's one of the issues that is still, you know, we've got it as well ideologically because some states have universal healthcare, so. No one has to complain it, it's their view. Other states have hybrid systems. We're not quite sure exactly what they are because they represent political compromises between different financial elites. So I just mentioned that because I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is uh, an easier thing, namely the role of the pandemic. Now, when you have a pandemic, effectually what this would mean is you have an emergency. And the state's role generally would be, well, it has to enact emergency legislation to manage the pandemic. If it's a widely spreadable pandemic, you want to curtail its spread. You want to administer therapies. You want to get people to come into the medical system to be properly taken care of. Now, the, 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 the AIN law, uh, this, there are the Syracuse principles drawn up by some international principles that touch on pandemics and so on. But let me just clarify a few things. Uh, 
let's just say that um, uh, the state enacts emergency legislation. Now, just to caution you, in the political sense, when the state enacts emergency legislation, you can bet your bottom dollar that a lot of people are going to be abused by torture and, and state abuses. So, so emergencies are not uh, an easy thing. They require control by the state and they require you to have some self-control as well, you see? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let me just give you a few examples. Uh, assuming you have the um, state of emergency, uh, do you impose testing on ordinary people? Or would they say, well, you know, I have a, a level of civic autonomy to be tested only if I consent to be tested. But, but you understand the problem. If I'm not tested, I don't know whether I'm a danger to the community or not. You see? Now, in the US, we've got a slightly more trivial problem. Um, uh, the president uh, has uh, um, made a joke of the normal things we would do to prevent the spread of the, of the pandemic. Uh, he's made a joke of wearing masks. And that meant that a lot of his supporters now say, if I have to wear a mask, the state is imposing itself on me and undermining my autonomy. So now nobody, those who feel their autonomy is being infringed, won't wear the mask and end up being a danger to everyone else. Uh, this could go further. I mean, you know, you need to do your, your basic hygienic things, but can the state force you to wash your hands after you go to the toilet? <laughs> oh, that's gonna be, so some people will resent the fact that the state says, okay, now you go wash your hands and use soap. You see, that's, how far can our emergency go to, to, to manage these aspects of individual autonomy? And not everyone wants to happily wash their hands or happily organize themselves with social distancing. Or maybe they resent the idea that I can only communicate with somebody else, not by a handshake, but by an elbow shake. You know, so, so, so there's a whole range of things that may go with the question of the distribution of the of the uh, of, of, of the of the virus and the limitations which run into very ordinary aspects of individual autonomy that we assume are OK. Now, just one thing to say about the masks and some other aspects. Uh, in this morning's news, it was uh, again stated that five, almost 500,000 Americans have died, largely through the bad practices of Mr. Trump. Uh, the, 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 uh, some people have said he was just stupid, but there's some documentation which shows that he did not want information about the virus to get out because it would have uh, uh, negative effects on the economy and that would deeply affect his capacity to be reelected. So that this wasn't just an accident, he seemed to scheme at it at a huge cost to the American people. Um, <clears throat> I, um, uh, we, of course, have not worked through all the other restrictions that may be necessary because of the contagiousness of the disease. And uh, uh, can we, for example, require people to take vaccinations? 
not only should we make it available for them or give them the transportation to get it, but if they refuse the vaccination, can we compel them to take it? Some people will say, I don't want to do it. But if you don't do it, you may end up a threat to your fellow citizens, you see? So uh, the question of... Uh, Megan, of, please come uh, to a conclusion. I come to a conclusion, all right. So, so the question of a human right to health care in the context of emergencies yes, is, at least in my opinion, a bit more complex than it's been presented. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Winston. Um, okay, um, I think um, it, it takes a, a lawyer to kind of make us aware of the fine print, and the fine print does matter, you know, in how you define human rights, the right to health, and and uh, you know the rights of one person relative to another, whether it's contrarian or, or uh, cor correlational. And uh, I think there is also some, perhaps, perhaps some need for innovation in an, in our legal thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're, 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 I think it's quite important that these things are explored. I haven't read much from the legal profession. It's not my field, but in the media, I haven't seen much at all on, on uh, any reflection by the legal profession on, uh, you know, the possibility of innovating there, or, you know, applying maybe the tools that are already available to resolving some of these questions in a reasonable way. May I just add something? Sure. Uh, um... Uh, there has been some quite revolutionary thinking done on this. And it was initiated by a former president of WAS, Harold Laswell, and his uh, uh, co-author, Myers McDougall. And uh, some of your, your fellows claim that I'm a bit of a protege of these guys. But what I can say is, even though this has been very well developed, including the idea that, that we, we should substitute for the rights-based ambiguity, uh, a focus on values and value processes as easier ways to get at the problems and how to solve them. Uh, but that has been pioneered by the world, by WAS, okay? So okay. Thank you very much, uh, well, Vincent. Like and uh, I will now uh, hand over to our last uh, uh, formal speaker, and that is uh, uh, Emil Constantinescu, former president of Romania, 96-2000, uh, and currently the president of uh, uh, a vast center of excellence, namely the Institute for Advanced Studies in Levant Culture and Civilization. Emil is also a trustee of, of VAS, and he uh, uh, and the, the, the center uh, uh, have a project on COVID. And I think uh, Emil would like to speak about that, but up yes. to you, Emil, but okay. please go ahead. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, dear fellow of, uh, and friends, uh, we talk about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as a system crisis. We discuss its uh, multiple field impact but we fail to discuss its impact of the most important actors within the people. I would like to leave the presentation of our project later uh, during the Q&A and continue uh, talking uh, about uh, this uh, issue. Okay. Uh, it is uh, highly important that to be aware that the debate of the pandemic need not be only about states and other actors. It needs to be first and foremost about the people. We often speak of uh, industries collapsing, but we fail to see that the people are the very first victims and they are all together the very industries. Uh, it has been uh, interesting to have uh, a look at the spirit of conformity manifested by billions of people around the world who decided to play safe and follow the rules of uh, the state of emergency imposed for a greater goal, that of surviving. 
the stress caused by a veritable house arrest of billions of people will leave uh, deep traces and will affect both our generation and that of the young, younger one. An uh, efficient uh, psychotherapy needs to begin uh, with understanding the very essence of the phenomenon. The paralyzing effect of the pandemic on social and economic life stemmed <clears throat> from the generalization of fear. The unemployed, homeless people, as well as the CEOs of great companies, president, the prime minister, have been equally affected. Let us not forget that this generalized fear was among the roots of all totalitarian regimes. When um, the ICU doctors, specialists in infection disease, pneumologists, uh, virologists uh, placed in the front line uh, of their fight with COVID uh, will have uh, ceased their mission. They will be replaced by the psychiatrist. At the end uh, of the terrible calamity that was the Second World War, the wrecking havoc was imposed not just on economy, but also on human souls. After the tragedy of the Titanic uh, 100 years ago, a common universal call for help was agreed upon SOS, Save Our Souls. 60 years ago, our academy was created by great scientists who understood very well the extent of damages that can be caused by wrongly used performances of science and technology, but also the human drama experienced by people worldwide, be they from defeated or the victors countries of the Second World War. Maybe this was uh, the reason why they named it the Academy of Art of Science, because art and literature can better heal human souls. Uh, in the portrait of Dorian Gray, there is a remarkable sentence, to heal your souls through senses and your senses through resort to one's soul. That Oscar Wilde as to that the souls is a terrible reality. It can be sold and bought. It can be poisoned or perfected. I might add to that, the soul can also be bought back. Those um, who are about to lose hope need to be reminded that a higher life goal can free one from fear. It is because of that that during this pandemic, the debate was centered on human rights and the moral values that guide our life. This is why I strongly, I strongly believe that this is the best time to act and we need to act now. It is high time that the academic milieu took a stand and mastered the debate on what can be done to overcome the crisis for the years to come and the generation, generations to follow. As uh, for the project that you mentioned, I'd you like to introduce it uh, you later in this uh, panel and invite uh, you all to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil, and thank you so much for reminding us of the, the remarkable uh, solidarity that so many people have shown uh, incorporating this restrictions, difficult though it may be, you know, undermining our togetherness, our, our, our sociality, as Fatma said earlier. And, uh, you know, in those countries, particularly with, with reasonably good leadership, 
uh, people have shown great uh, willingness to sacrifice their individual rights and freedoms for a greater good, which they understood rationally and also from their heart. And uh, that combination is very important and something you don't often hear in, a, in, a, in the academic circuit, but it, it is in a way also what defines uh, the World Academy that we do take this a combined approach. I mean, we understand that uh, our our psyche, our souls, our feelings matter, you know, and having our heart in the right place. It's not just a matter of being reasoned uh, because pure reason or reason reduced to an instrument then becomes uh, dangerous as our founders well realized. So reason has to be tempered by compassion and uh, consideration for others and I think, uh, as you said, that willingness is was there to an amazing degree, and we should take some some hope from that and some confidence when we we look at some of the other crises like climate change. You know, people are willing to make some sacrifices if they're uh, uh, informed properly, if they are, uh, if it is explained properly. Uh, now we, the the uh, section of formal s speakers is finished, but we had a lot of interest in this panel, and a number of people came in later, and we've invited them as special guests who also have uh, much expertise, as much as the the regular speakers in on in this regard. And I will now ask them uh, to speak uh, in order of appearance. Uh, but before I begin. Uh, First of all, some apologies from Professor Bartolome Rivas Osonas, a former professor of uh, University of Madrid and a vast fellow who is also, also past secretary general of the Royal National Academy of Pharmacy in Spain. Unfortunately, he, he has sustained an injury on a, uh, he is also a, 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 an injury on, the, on a mission to Libya and is unable to attend. But he was going to talk about the uh, uh, macroeconomic impact of um, the pandemic and in particular, the sort of regionalization of the world economy. Ole, Professor Ole Peterson, who is a board member of uh, SAPEA, which stands for Science Advice for Policy by European uh, Academies and uh, Sabir so is doing amazing work, work uh, in, in the background for, you know, as far as the general public is concerned, perhaps not so visible, but to sound is clearly, you know, quite visible. Uh, their uh, policy advice to the European Commission, in particular, you, you can tell in the, in the policies, just the quality of, of advice that is that is being given, and uh, Sapia is a part of that. So I now uh, ask uh, Professor Peterson to speak about uh, uh, Sapia's work on on and his own work uh, on COVID and the the main insights from that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Reuter, for giving me this opportunity to say a few remarks. Uh, I should say that what I'm going to say now is, are my personal views, and they are not official views, neither of SAPIA nor of Academia Europea. And in fact, both of these organizations have not, at this point in time, made any statements about COVID-19. So these are just my own very personal remarks. Uh, I would like to start perhaps a bit pessimistically uh, with saying that we do have some difficulties learning from the past. And I want to quote from the very great Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. He said, it is obvious that art cannot teach anyone anything, since in 4,000 years humanity has learned nothing at all. We should long ago have become angels had we been capable of paying attention to the experience of art and allowing ourselves to be changed in accordance with the ideals it expresses. Now, uh, there have been very many pandemics throughout the history of humanity and they have been attributed to many different causes, not least uh, to the anger of God over the bad behavior of, of human beings. 
Now, of course, we are supposed to live in a very rational world, uh, science driven, and we are supposed to be in control. However, I would, even as a primary biomedical scientist, uh, raise some doubts about whether we really are in control. Seen from a biomedical uh, science point of view, the pandemic uh, so far uh, has been uh, quite a bit of a disaster. Two and a half million people have died, uh, and they have died in very bad circumstances, isolated from their partners, from their parents, from their children. Intriguingly and somewhat humiliatingly for a biomedical scientist, uh, those countries who are supposed to have particularly strong biomedical science, like the US and the UK and Western Europe, have done particularly badly in the pandemic. The US, prime example, 20% of the deaths have occurred in the US with only 4% of the world's population. Now, the World Health Organization also did not initially cover itself in glory, I have to say. It was very late in recommending the use of face masks, and that undoubtedly cost many, many lives. Also, it advocated continuous uh, international travel at a time when curbing international travel undoubtedly could have helped a great deal. China demonstrated the example, which is well known from masses of epidemics going back thousands of years, that quarantine actually works. And the isolation of Wuhan, uh, which actually protected essentially the whole of the Chinese population, was seen very, very early, communicated, and yet Western world failed to take lessons from that. In fact, we even failed to take lessons from the first wave so that the second wave became even worse. So these are remarkable examples of our inability actually to learn both from very fast experience and more uh, recently. Now, uh, the coronavirus has a very strong image. It has these uh, wonderful uh, spike proteins jutting out of the central ball. And uh, the world has been perhaps a bit uh, fixated on these spike proteins. They are, of course, the target for the vaccines, which will disable these spike proteins from entering the lock on the outside of the cells that will allow the virus to enter. And vaccines undoubtedly has been a very impressive program and almost certainly it will have a degree of effect. However, the spike proteins are subject to mutation and we can already begin to see that there will be a race between the ability of scientists continuously to redesign the vaccine and of course, having the enormous production apparatus that is needed to convey them to publications at large and the ability of the virus to mutate and essentially enter what we know as immune escape. We still have to see uh, who will uh, win that race. That should also remind us not to put all our eggs in one basket. It is interesting that while the vaccination program, as I said, is very important and certainly impressive, nevertheless, we have been willing to spend billions of dollars on the vaccine program and unwilling to spend even thousands of dollars on other measures that could have a great deal of effect. The spike proteins are not the only vulnerabilities of, this, of the virus. Uh, it has a fat soluble envelope. And if we dissolve that envelope, the virus is emasculated. Several commercially available uh, mouse washes are known and have been shown in peer reviewed papers in, in strong journals to kill the virus within 20 seconds. Yet it has been impossible to engender interest from funding bodies to fund clinical trials to test whether these things actually work in, in, in real life. Unfortunately, science funding particularly is very much fashion driven, much more so than most of scientists are willing to admit. We know that there have been strong programs proposed in the US several years ago for a different kind of vaccine that might actually hit all different types of coronaviruses and they were not funded. Now there begins to be a bit of interest in this. This pandemic will come to an end as all our pandemics have come, uh, but it still remains to be seen whether this will mainly be through the efforts of human beings or whether it will be just some luck that mutations will create more beneficial for us forms of the virus and therefore it will die out. And with these somewhat provocative remarks, I will finish my intervention. Thank you very much, Professor Ryder. 
Thank you, Olive, for this microbiological perspective on things and also your perspective on, you know, our, the great difficulty we, we have in, in actually learning anything at all, especially when it comes to fundamental issues. And um, uh, it, it, isn't it just amazing? I just uh, read uh, recently a mathematician has calculated the total volume of all the COVID viruses in the world at the moment. And uh, it turns out it is less in volume than a glass of wine. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's these things that matters of scale, really, uh, that's, that's quite uh, important. Some, sometimes what is so small escapes our, our attention, <laughs> or it, we think it doesn't deserve our attention until it actually hits us. And, and also on the macro scale, climate change, really slow moving, big picture, geophysical systems, also we struggle and to, 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 to learn that, that these are real threats <clears throat> because we're so focused on our daily flow of events that passes before us. But uh, I hand over now to Kathleen Walter Baumer, who's a, <coughs> a, a chairman of the Econet Foundation and has been working in a very different part of the world and I look very much look forward to your comments. Kathleen, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to say to the organizers, Gary and everyone, uh, this last few days uh, has unfailingly been very interesting and in a time when unity and diversity or diversity and unity is needed more than ever. Um, and technology makes it possible for so many of us to be together um, virtually. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I have prepared formal, somewhat formal remarks and I will ask your forbearance if, if it's slightly over five minutes, uh, but it shouldn't be. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I was invited by Gary and Thomas to speak about, quote, COVID in Africa in only five minutes. And I was addressed, asked to address the topic in part because uh, for the past several years, I've worked as special advisor for one of Africa's top technology entrepreneurs and philanthropists, uh, a Zimbabwean called Strive Masiwa, who last May was appointed by then African Union Chair and South African President Cyril Ramaphosa to be one of the African Union's special envoys for COVID response, focused specifically on marshalling private sector support to fight the COVID pandemic. Uh, Mr. Masiwa also leads the African Vaccine Acquisi Acquisition Task Team, uh, which was established by the African Union and uh, is very busy right now, as you can imagine. Today though, I'm, I'm speaking solely in my personal capacity as, as a WASP fellow. I don't work on our COVID project day to day, but since early last year, together with Ms. Mr. Masiwa, I've helped to create educational messaging and materials for young people across the African continent, focused mostly on uh, ways and means to avoid contracting COVID, as well as the importance of COVID testing and contact tracing if necessary and fairly soon we'll be working on uh, educational materials uh, about the vaccine. I was earlier asked to introduce myself and, and so I'll just do it quickly. Back in the 1990s, I was named a, a WASH Junior Fellow. And back then I was a democracy and governance practitioner who since about 1985 worked in projects all over the world focusing on democratic elections, leadership development, strategic communications and institutional development, mostly in failing states and or um, aspiring democracies, which is how I arrived in South Africa in 93 and have not returned since. And um, it was really great to, to learn Winston is a fellow South African. I'm actually American, but I've permanent resident here. Um, I'm now more focused or almost entirely focused on helping citizens develop skills that lead toward economic pr prosperity to uh, accompany the political freedom uh, the ballot box that I've focused on earlier in my career. For the daunting, uh, what I call daunting contribution, as I've already mentioned, it may be slightly over time. Um, I would calculated that speaking this late in the panel, I'd be able to delete quite a bit of my presentation and be uh, spot on five minutes, but um, I'm not quite sure I succeeded. Let me start with a few quick facts to put our continental pandemic challenge here in context. As most of you know, Africa is 54 sovereign nations, 
uh, 55 African Union member states with population of 1.36 billion people, which is 16.72% of the world's population, which speaks somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000 languages. Uh, there's quite a vast difference, but uh, some languages are only spoken now by a few people, as the anthropologists will know uh, in this group. Uh, and the median age is 19.7 years old. And uh, I think the, the burgeoning youth population in Africa and the challenge of that is well known. As of February 5th, at least 3.78 million people across the continent have been infected with the coronavirus and approximately 98,600 have died. To achieve so-called herd immunity, Africa will require an estimated 1.5 billion doses of the COVID vaccine. For many reasons, this will be extremely challenging, some of which were touched upon earlier because it's a global challenge. And it's estimated by the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, in January 31st assessment that this could actually take Africa well into the year 2024 to achieve in, throughout the continent. Although the first wave did not hit most African countries very hard, at least 40 countries have recently experienced the second wave of the pandemic with the new so-called South African variant appearing to cause increasingly rapid transmission of the virus, as well as the unfortunate calamity here that the AstraZeneca vaccines, which arrived in South Africa on the 1st of February, to much celebration on a very rainy day um, on the tarmac in Johannesburg, were soon discovered when testing took place to be ineffective against the new variant. And this, the, the planned nationwide rollout to health workers uh, was immediately suspended and plan B had to be made. It's actually quite interesting because plan B happened today. Uh, yesterday, Johnson & Johnson vaccines, 80,000 units arrived uh, and the first jabs to health workers and the president of the country happened just a little bit earlier today. In one of the Monday panels, the power of the media and social media was mentioned, and everyone here is aware that African, the African narrative told by international media usually focuses a great deal on the continent's disasters rather than its innovations and huge potential in this century. Nevertheless, when it comes to the pandemic, as everyone knows, there is much bad news to be mentioned. As the recent Economist cover story remarked, there's likely to be a long COVID in Africa. Last year, the sub-Saharan African economy shank, shrank for the first time in 25 years. At least 32 million more Africans fell into extreme poverty. That's defined, as you probably know, earning uh, less than uh, US 190 a day, with the emerging middle class very, hardly, very hard hit. Tourism industries, which generate a huge amount of Forex and jobs have been crushed by travel restrictions and, and very strict nationwide uh, lockdowns, much more strict than most Western nations. Wildlife poaching is up in part because of economic desperation. And as elsewhere in the world, there's been widespread closure of schools with all the yet unknown consequences <clears throat> of delayed education on Africa's burgeoning youth population, partially due to the inequitable access to online learning alternatives. Amongst the good news in Africa in this challenging chapter is the historically unprecedented cooperation. These are all good was words. Cooperation, collaboration, and coordinated communication across African national governments, multilateral institutions, and in some cases, the private sector in trying to tackle the pandem pandemic with an integrated response. I'll just give you a few examples of good news. Uh, because I think we need it. Uh, first, from early 2020, a continent-wide collaboration to fight the pandemic led by the AU work, was working in concert with the UN Economic Commission on Africa, the Afro Exxon Bank and the Africa Center for D Disease Control, which was established in 2016 to boost the continent's public health policies. Groundbreaking technological innovations have been introduced to tackle a pandemic and help restart economies as soon as possible. Just to mention too, the Africa Medical Supply Pat Platform was developed as a not-for-profit venture launched last year to unlock immediate access to 
an African and global base of vetted manufacturers and procurement strategic partners to enable the AU member states to purchase certified medical equipment such as diagnostic kits and so forth with increased cost effectiveness and transparency. The key was really transparency. Designed as a not-for-profit venture by an African development team, um, IT development team, which includes some from our co own companies. The AMSP was developed as a unique interface to enable volume aggregation, quota management, payment facilitation, as well as logistics and transportation to ensure equitable and efficient access to the supplies uh, for African governments, specifically for African governments. Also developed was the Africa CDC Travel Pass, an app-based social innovation launched very recently, developed also by African developers to secure digital health passport to help African and international borders open up again, and in so doing, start rebuilding our shattered economies. I'll put links to some of these in, in the chat box. Some of you may know this, but it's just a bit more good news. As the pandemic hit last year, philanthropic innovators from across the world who were suffering their own challenges, such as Richard Branson with his closing gyms and the closing uh, or the grounded flights, he actually jumped in to collaborate to help Africa innovate and licensed designs free of charge for oxygen helmets and affordable ventilators from Virgin Orbit and, and Virgin Galactic. Uh, and finally, uh, closer to home, as is now well known, South Africa's research scientists in the last less than two months discovered the more transmiss transmissible 501.v2 COVID variant in the nick of time and informed the world of this dangerous mutation. It was in the December, um, they let them know. The huge contribution of our South African scientists and high-tech labs and academic networks, which we need to add to WAS, with HIV and tuberculosis research equipment and expertise, pivoted brilliantly to put this variant on the map and save our South African population from being jabbed with ineffective AstraZeneca vaccine, as well as alert the world that the variant can escape antibodies and potentially lead to reinfection. And, and I know there's probably some youth here and, and some young at heart. Uh, because we are WAS uh, and with an intention, intentional focus on soul healing arts, um, I want to be sure to mention the pandemic anthem, which some of you may have heard, called the Jerusalem, was born in South Africa. It was written by DJ Master KG, with, sung by vocalist, South African so vocalist Namsibo Sikode. And the dance itself was first choreographed in Angola. So it was a multinational cheering up the world effort. And I'll also share some links if you want to spot a smile. And maybe some WASP fellows have been involved in doing the Jerusalem, or maybe that's something. It was really globally uniting. Uh, finally, in closing, and I think of relevance to WASP looking forward uh, as it wants to develop and ignite a planetary momentum to newly uh, innovative human-centered solutions. I attended a virtual conference last December hosted by the Africa CDC, convened to develop a framework for fair, equitable, and timely allocation of COVID-19 vaccines in Africa. One Africa CDC expert panel, very relevant to WAS's vision, WAS's vision, focused concretely on how to ensure the African indigenous values and principles of, of Ubuntu are reflected in vaccine allocation. As many of you know, Ubuntu roughly translates as I am what I am because of other people, a principle which affirms the mutual humanity of others, the importance of survival of the community, social solidarity, and meaningful human uh, communal, community engagement. Going forward, as difficult decisions are being made all over the world, but especially the global south on allocation and rollout priorities, the Ubuntu framework emphasizes emphasizes a focus on, and this was how it was explained in, in, in the closing session of that conference, allocation decisions for societal benefit and promoting common good while respecting human dignity, ensuring every person has equal dignity, worth and value, hence allocation decisions must be non-discriminatory, ensuring characteristics such as ethnicity, nationality, gender, sexual orientation, race and gender do not play a role in allocation decisions, and finally, that all people must be treated fairly and equally. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Very, very interesting. And, you know, we all carry on about how multilateralism is on its knees, but it seems in Africa it's working quite well. And I've heard a little about that. And I've also heard quite a lot about innovation in Africa in response to uh, COVID, both technical and IT innovation and practical on the ground innovation, thanks to a colleague of mine who was an anthropologist and was in Cape Town and was involved in some of those initiatives. And yeah, we, we have a lot to learn from Africa and, and also clearly uh, globally COVID is not going to be defeated unless it and until it has to be, de de be defeated in every country. And gradually that realization will sink in, I'm confident, because we know that from past uh, fights against disease that, uh, you know, like smallpox, you have to eradicate it everywhere, if indeed that is at all possible with, with this particular coronavirus. It may not be possible, but even to control it, that principle applies. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> Luvuyo Madasa, one of our junior fellows, and I'd ask him to comment later in discussion uh, and uh, give us uh, some more insights on Africa. But now um, I invite Professor Jan Doprovolsky from uh, AGH University of Science and Technology uh, and the Open University of Poland. He's a vast fellow. Please, uh, Jan, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. And uh, well, I do hope that all experts would like to agree with Latin proverb. Um, primum non not uh, is the most important, seems to be efficient primary prevention. If we agree on this point, let us focus on prevention against the contamination of the air, drinking water and food with mutagens. As we know, this pandemic is connected with new mutants. And already in 1975, at the first World Congress, Scientists for Better Human Environment, I introduced problem of primary prevention of, well, contamination of the total human environment. It means natural environment, food, and indoor environment in buildings against different kinds of mutagens, taking into consideration synergistic effects of different chemical pollutants, physical factors, and biological as well. So we have to take into consideration very transdisciplinary monitoring for early detection of risk factors and for efficient primary prevention at the sources, very different sources, as you know, in industry, well, in different kinds of uh, transport facilities, in agriculture and many, many others. So this is starting point for prevention. As, as all of us are familiated nowadays, unfortunately, there are still new and new mutants, more transmissible in different regions of the world, in Brazil, in South Africa, in uh, Great uh, in Britain, etc. So we as a human beings are facing with, let's say, risk factors for all of us. And all of us should be, I think, very active. Let me stress more active in common action. Action integrating all partners. It means experts from complementary fields, life sciences, biomedical in particular, but not only agriculture, many, many others, social sciences, of course, and technical and other. So I think some kinds of transdisciplinary case study should be a starting point for common action of experts from all disciplines and knowledge-based society. It should be, I think, common action, open for all, and for benefit to all. It's of course global, because we are in fact one family. We are living in one indivisible the biosphere. It's one system of ecosystems. So 
Uh, I think probably the only one positive output of this terrible pandemic is maybe better understanding that the human beings were integrated by one, let's say, the, the earth, the only one, let's say, place for living, still more and more integrated because of different kinds of system of transport, of uh, exchange of, of, uh, of course, um, human resources, and food, etc. So our family should be also much more integrated in common action for, first of all, better, it means more efficient prevention, and also for increasing our resistance. Because, well, now let me refer to W Nobel Prize winner, Professor Pauling, recommendation. We, I met him in many years ago at the conference at Bath Place of European Institute of Ecology and Cancer, you know, primary prevention of cancer. And Professor Pauling teaches us that we have to focus on nutritional prevention, namely for supplementation of human diet with protecting factors like some vitamins. He was expert, as you know, top expert in vitamin C and some essential elements in human food. So it is a problem of better, let's say, dissemination of knowledge useful for all and application in practice. Still, it's a problem of different kinds of psychological barrier. And of course, the problem I think of crucial importance is education. Education beginning from the third generation, the most experienced uh, also scientists and practitioners until primary school. It means intergeneration, international integration for benefit of all. It is, I think, a game, just game or even World War II war for prevention uh, against premature deaths of millions of people. Every, every month we, are, we have still more and more victims. And in fact, it would be possible to prevent the sources, of course, but also to decrease, let's say, sensitivity by stimulation our immunological system, by nutritional, let's say, health, or integration, environmental health, and nutritional health. So I would like to recommend some kinds of maybe Initi new initiative, all sponsored or initiated by the, our World Academy, and cooperating, of course, in, in organizations, just to start with online distance education, at least in two complementary mm -hmm. training, problem solving, of course, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, better, uh, in training of experts, starting from postgraduate courses, maybe doctoral studies, something like that and also lifelong learning, open for all, open for all and well, giving some, some kinds of knowledge, of course, proper for people of different age, different possibilities, but all of us should be involved in this, I think, game for better quality of life. And, uh, thank you, thank you, Professor, that's, that's very helpful. And, uh, um, and uh, I, I no point to go into details, but I think you, you're quite right uh, about primary prevention and, and its importance because COVID doesn't come yes. into a vacuum. There are, like I mentioned earlier, also pre existing conditions, uh, non communicable diseases, general ill health, uh, all be. contribute to the impact of or impl uh, uh, increase the impact or the mortality rate under COVID. So it's, we can't see it in isolation. Thank you for reminding us of that. Let me Thank just to, to, to conclude. I think we have to learn from the biosphere. We have to learn more from, let's say, ecological, or as a function of ecosystem. Biomimetics seems to be a future of our civilization. And uh, I am very glad that the eminent expert and my friend, Professor Bartolomeu Ribas from Royal Academy, he will, let's say, introduce his great, great experiences in study useful for practical application. And he is also very good affiliated after long-term mission in very poor region of Latin America. So integration of this 
very deep scientific knowledge with, let's say, um, good practice in different yeah. regions facing with a uh, well, very high risk of incidence of this pandemic is, uh, I think, yes. very thank, thank you very much for inviting um, uh, a senior researcher from Stanford University, Robert E. Horn, who's a real COVID expert, and I look forward to his, his experience, his recommendations and insights. Uh, Robert, please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm follow, I'll follow up a bit on, uh, on what uh, uh, Mike Marion was saying, because I got very interested in um, uh, what we don't know. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in my life um, as an advisor, as a, uh, uh, a helper uh, of uh, various kinds of decision makers and policy makers, uh, and have had the opportunity to help uh, structure information for them, uh, particularly visually. I'm one of the few um, people in the Academy of Art and science that combines both art and science in my everyday practice. As a result, I have some visual for you. Um, the uh, thing that struck me in April of last year was this diagram. Uh, Perhaps you all saw it. I'm assuming most of you saw it, at least. It was called the flatten the curve diagram. Uh, and uh, I got, to in got interested in it because uh, uh, I wasn't sure we knew very much about the flatten of the curve. How, much, how, how were decision makers actually being talked to by scientists? And how much were they actually saying, here's what we know and here's what we don't know. So I started asking around about that. And uh, I, I don't know whether this is entirely possible. This is an experiment in, in, uh, in, 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 in conveying some information, but I started to identify the parts of this diagram, which I had never seen before and started asking around. And it became important uh, to me to identify what we do not know, even about this one simple diagram at one particular time, April of 2020. It turns out we didn't know hardly anything about it. There was no data. There was no data about the number of undiagnosed cases, the number of diagnosed cases, the number of actual infections, the infection rate, the contact rate, the number of infections, the total number of cases the country, in country by region, exact day of the first case, the time frame of the, I could go on with another uh, 10 in, in this particular list. They're all on the diagram, which I can provide to you if you send, if you send me an email. Um, hornbob at earthlink.net. I'm particularly interested that decision makers were, un, were very likely not told about all this unknown information. What we knew about this particular diagram was that it was a, um, uh, uh, a model that had been based on previous um, uh, pandemics. And that it was important uh, in one particular case because the healthcare, we, we needed to know what the healthcare capacity was, that is uh, by the blue, uh, the blue diagram uh, to keep the cases below that. So there we were scientists, uh, and I would say hopefully visualizers as well, showing decision makers what was known and what was unknown. Now I got very interested in this and because this whole, the whole COVID uh, situation in the past year has uh, turned up even more and more unknowns as many as we've begun to discover some of the, some of the knowns and, and, and indeed with the, uh, 
vaccines, the critical, some of the critical knowns have become known. Um, however, for, for, for uh, sciences and visualizers uh, together, to artists and scientists together, I'm, I'm, I want to invite, uh, I'm very interested in seeing how we can structure this kind of unknowns is rather the knowns because typically uh, we advisors to decision makers go in with our knowns and say, here's what, here's what you can do, or here's what we think we know. And in this case, of course, it was only a model of past, of past uh, history. So I think we can, uh, there's, a, there's a project to be uh, undertaken uh, by uh, us in the uh, World Academy to uh, learn how to structure unknowns for decision makers and to be able to visualize them easily and quickly. And I invite uh, uh, you to, uh, uh, who are interested to be a part of that. Um, as I said, get in contact with me and, uh, and maybe we can make some progress on this. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That's very interesting. Mm, clearly, uh, that that image there. I, mean, I think we're dealing with a heuristic, uh, at best, and it's very important to question these sort of fundamental assumptions. I think generally it might have been right, but there's so little we really actually knew. It was at, at best a heuristic. Uh, I now um, invite uh, uh, Professor. Faris Garan Kapetanovic, uh, who is a professor at the University of Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina and AVAS fellow. Uh, Faris, please uh, share with us your views. Over to you. Thank you. Respected uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, dear Mr. Reiter, uh, greetings to all the participants and you as well. Uh, on the very beginning, it's an honor to be present at this session, and uh, I would like to be inside of the given time, two or three minutes, which was actually uh, open before. Outbreak uh, consequences of coronavirus uh, disease 19 demonstrated the fragility of health system worldwide. Some consequences hit my country as well, especially with our highly decentralized political and health system, allowed me to share with you some background information uh, which will prove this. Too many decision makers, while too little courage to pass on right decision, decentralized system with open up doors for severe and evident corruption cases from buying respirators to vaccine at least three times more uh, than established prices. In addition to these significant problems, Long lasting problem occurred in uh, two problems which I uh, focus and stress here. The hazard of closeness or proximity, the fear in being in close communication, benefit of new uh, European freedom of movement, people, goods, ideas, and capital, fear in being in close communication will not put an end to the strongest European freedom of movement. And the second one, dying in solitude. The moment the patient enters ICU, intensive care unit and placed on respirator, he or she is completely on his or her own, except the medical staff. Family cannot visit the patient. This is only possible if he leaves the hospital, fight for one's life, is fought for patient only without much needed family love and support. Uh, reaching the end, in given the circumstances, I will just uh, uh, give a few ideas about the management, actually the operative management, according to the potential of virtual space is diminished. Strategic, strategic management becomes more important and coming closer to leadership. The leaders and strategic managers have to face two main questions. What is ahead of us? What is going on when pandemic stops? This is the first question. And the second one, what we have to do if nothing changes. I hope that with these several thoughts, I will provoke exchange of creative ideas. I'm looking forward to hear them. And thank you for your attention. Uh, I said I'm just going to be inside of the given limits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faris. 
And finally, I invite Heron Jose de Santana Gordillo, who is a professor at the Federal University of Bahia in Brazil and a vast fellow. Over to you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks, Professor Thomas, for the, for the invitation. I'd like to um, greet Professor Negan, Professor Saulo, and all the fellows of the bus. And I'd like to first to sympathize to the two million and 500,000 people dead around the world today for the COVID-19. Um, I was in the beginning of the pandemic, I was in French as a, prof a visiting professor at a, a college of the Tudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Uh, and I, I, I from, from November to March. So I, I faced this pandemic in the beginning and I returned to Brazil. And now I can, I can infer that, that uh, uh, I think about that, all the, that problem. I think as Emily Dukan talk about suicide. And I think that the COVID-19 is not a, a health problem, it's a social problem. Um, why uh, I say that? Because the most people with a problem and that the average of death is elevated at a high level have problems in the society. I mean, you can talk about enemy, uh, the nominalness, the conflict, this kind of problem that um, um, do not permit the cohesion into the society. So if you talk, if you, if you look at the country that uh, the level of death, you can see that the most of the country have problems, social problems or political problems like United States and Brazil and French and United Kingdom and, uh, and, and others that have problems, Sweden too. Uh, is there are some specific um, countries like Belgium that have social and political problem, but have to, uh, the, the, the specific condition is not the only condition. Some, uh, the, the home care uh, from people, uh, the oldest people. So it is the, the, the conclusion that I, I'd like to, to show you. Because if you see um, in, in, in Brazil, particularly the states have, uh, and Sao Paulo, for example, is the most uh, population, the uh, most population in the country is in, in, in Sao Paulo, and the, the death is not, the level of the death is not so high because there are, we are, we are a federation in this state, the governor and the mayor have a, 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 a deal, a, a good relationship. So we have problems in the presidency, in the federal government and with the states. So um, if, you, if you take a look at the Brazilian rate of death for COVID-19, you can see that the states that have problem, political problem, and, uh, and the breakdown in the social relationship, the level of the death is, is right. Um, for in, in the end, I, I would like to to remark that the black people around the world, and especially United States and Brazil, the is a double white people. It's a problem that reveal the inequality in country like Brazil and United States, because uh, most of the black people die from this pandemic. And at the end, uh, it's important to remark the it's an environmental problem. It's an environmental disaster. The deforestation, uh, the the destroy uh, of the habitat of the wildlife, wildlife, especially the bats, is uh, is, is turning this pandemic in this is environmental disasters. And unfortunately, it is one of the other that is coming. 
So thank you, Professor. It is my contribution. Thank you too. And thank you for reminding us of the, the, the link also, as John mentioned before, to the ecological health, you know, the, the uh, process of biodiversity loss is not unrelated to uh, uh, the, the, you know, to, the, to this epidemic, you know, because as humans encroach on habitats, there is exposure to new viruses. Uh, that's, that's definitely a, a factor. And also, thank you for reminding us that apart from inequality, it's, it's also, uh, no, there's a little bit more to social cohesion. It's, there may be political problems that disrupt it on top of inequality or a different sort of a cultural attitude. And it's remarkable just how well the, 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 the countries in East Asia did in, in coping with the crisis. Like I mentioned Vietnam before, it's really quite spectacular, but it's, it's really the whole of East Asia has done pretty well. And, and uh, I think it, it may well have something to do with a more sort of social attitude, less individualistic, rights-based sort of attitude and more like a sense of uh, having to do to, uh, to one's share for the benefit of, of the whole and something maybe we can learn from that. Professor Reber, so, uh, share with us your views. Over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation from Professor Gary Jacobs and from Professor, uh, Professor Thomas Reuter. And uh, as biochemist, I propose data on molecular biochemistry to prevent possible contagious and pathology of COVID-19 produced by virus virus SARS-CoV-2. Uh, about the pandemic and systemic stress, yes, the human body, we are vulnerable to food and also our systemic, all our systemic organs. <clears throat> Before then, mask distances, confinement and vaccines, we need to have a healthy safety and robust body to prevent and to resist the virus SARS-CoV-2 and other virus, bacteria, fungus, and toxic agents really present in air, in our diet, objects, and in our life. We need to strengthen ourselves to improve our health. The 70% of our immune system depends directly on our gastrointestinal system. We need to have fruits in the breakfast and have salads by lunch and supper, apporting vitamins and essential mineral elements. There are cofactors and links of the 80% of our proteins and enzymes in our human body. They are catalysators of our metabolism and indispensable to healthy, safety, and robust human body to defend or contagious, also from low genetic obesity and preventing activity longevity, as we do in our courses in the Royal Academy Institute, Institute of Spain. We justify our exposure because the contagion of the human body with virus and mutants of coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 develop in our organism a paradigmatic defense metabolic activity of energetic chemical reactions in cytoplasma and mitochondria based to obtain energy through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, and different reduction enzymes in proteins depending from glutathione. Glutathione is a very important uh, uh, molecule reduction in our organism through the enzymatic activity of millions by chemical reaction per second. Without them, there are no defense mechanisms and we suffer from contagious of COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> before the plethora of molecules synthesized after the contagious, like the cytokine storm, Defense lymphocytes, immunoglobulins, etc., etc., is it the case of pandemic or the virus 
the supplement among others and vitamin C and D in addition of zinc and cysteine because zinc is cofactor of more than 300 proteins and enzymes activating our immune system. And cysteine, part of the glutathione, that is the glutamyl cysteinyl glycine. It is a conclusion to hear and to apply scientific expert proposals to apply scientific data of human homeostasis itself and does not manifest fear as it is now transmitted to our peers today. It is a question of responsibility of decision makers, politics and governments. The second conclusion of my intervention is to help to the poor population has done and do my son Martin Rivas in South Yucatan, Mexico, near Guatemala, the diocese of Chetumal has provided more than 50,000 balanced diet meals to families, houses, and queues of indigenous people in the streets, as also experienced by my German granddaughter, Sofia Selrivas, has also lo lovingly treated, encouraged, and trained disabled people in three different homes in Beirut, Lebanon. She participated in the so-called caravan project, which is organized by the German and Lebanese Order of Malta. The group of young people from various countries comes to Beirut for a year, serve, help, and lovely train and poor the sick people of the country as there are constructive proposals made by our panel members and concretely by Professor Dobrovolsky, it is necessary to better integration of cooperation of interdisciplinary. Education, teaching, and training is the best way to prevent and to fight the spread of COVID-19 pandemic in all rich and poor population of our humanity. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Professor Rebus. That's that's very important. In fact, I, I must say I have not seen much in the media about the relevance of uh, a diet in resilience to COVID and, of course, other diseases. And we we do know though that clearly uh, people with malnutrition, people with poor nutrition in 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 in, in countries like the U.S. have been clearly are more, more likely, to, you know, they've had higher uh, mortality rates. That's clear, but there isn't much advice, there isn't much hard data on the impact on, of diet and general health. Uh, yeah. And we have very, very little time left. Now, I would like to have a, a young voice to, to end this, this uh, session and I'd like to invite, uh, invite uh, Luvuya Madasa to, to, to speak uh, if he, if he would like to uh, and just give us a, a sort of a youth perspective as a, as a youth activist, youth leader and uh, as a junior fellow. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to engage. I think in the main, the, the underlying theme is for us to, to just listen and continue doing the work that has been done by the WASC community because in very many ways, each of us have in one way or another, confessed the reality of us not knowing. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know what the answers are. And we are all trying to figure out how to solve for the very many life-saving and the very many life-changing strategies that we need to put in place. I think this specifically for South Africa, given um, what Kathleen had shared around um, an initial option for a vaccine only learning in December that we have a variant that makes the vaccine not necessarily effective for South Africa specifically and needing to look at other options. It also requires us in each of our spaces as as much of the process in the WASC community, but specifically now in other communities that we all look to influence 
the importance of taking what is accepted as knowledge or structure or scientific and being intentional about adapting it to our communities so that it is received well and um, specific to responses and strategies around the COVID reality saves the lives that is meant to save. And I think in very many of the contributions I've listened to this evening, and I'm sure many, other in, many others in the audience, the main message, the underlying reality is for all of us to take the human step, which is to accept that we are all learning about this reality. Some may know more than others, but in listening and trying to understand first and then acting prudently because again, lives are at stake. We can learn how to solve for this reality, whether it is we learn how to live with it going forward in whatever variation that means or finding a way to eradicate it. The models we apply in solving for this pandemic will serve us well in other spaces that we operate in. So mine is just a listening in and reflecting back, um, not being a scientist um, and more someone who's in the change management and community engagement space who by virtue of the work that we do is impacted by the limitations and regulations around the human contact. We're gonna need to learn how to adapt. We're gonna need to learn how to continue to serve the purpose that we're here to service but in a meaningful way that doesn't threaten um, those who are already living on the edge and in a meaningful way that um, empowers those who need to have access to information that in very many instances is going to be life-saving. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for all your contributions and thank you for the work that each of you continue to be dedicated to and the culture of openness that is in the WAS community, I think, will serve us very well if complemented with the learnings we choose to continue sharing as we all learn together and make sense of how to make it beyond this current global pandemic. Diabulela, I thank you. Thank you, Lavoya. Wise words. I don't know what more I can say. It's very true what you point out that. Uh, we all have a small part of the answer or maybe a large part if you're very specialized on this issue and we need to work together and it's very important to have these spaces like we have in Vals where people of very different backgrounds can meet also beyond science and thank you for reminding us of the art of, of listening to others you know who, who may have different priorities from us different preconceptions but that's what makes conversations interesting. And we need to listen even to people at the opposite, opposite spectrum of science, the anti-vaxxers, for example, and understand what, what their, their real concerns are at, 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 the, at the core and, uh, and talk to those concerns rather than staying at the surface and very quickly just dismissing those concerns. Uh, Unless, uh, would any of my co-organizers like to have a, a final word, uh, Fadwa or uh, Michael? Yes. Um, I, I mean, okay. this has been unbelievably impressive and I, I feel reinforced by all the positivity. I mean, we live in, as I said, we've got a massive convergent uh, crisis, threats and so on. And we're in this together. And I think more and more after this, this session, I, I feel that we know that we're in this together and we're no, nobody's trying to be brave anymore about pretending they know everything. And for me, having spent a lot of time in really bad places where I did know, not know whether I was going to leave or not in one piece, um, this COVID thing, my city's been very, very lucky, very lucky. Um, it's been lucky because of the cooperation of all the citizens to buy into protecting ourselves. And we have, uh, even though we're 120,000 people total, we're a considerable distance from the main centers in Ontario, like Ottawa and, and, and Toronto. Uh, we have seven major groups nationality-wise, Indonesians, Somalis, K 
Kenyans. And we, we have worked together uh, to stay safe. And we've never been locked down, although we've been restricted, of course. And everybody's got a mask on their gear shift of their car. And I, I, again, the youth at our universities have been superb helping old folks. We've had the terrible things that have happened in old folks home and chronic care facilities too. But the young have come out to help. So the positivity that I, the increased positivity I feel this morning reinforces my commitment to the concept of humanity security. We've got to get past the days when human security was just a sideline and wasn't mainstream. And this is the best opportunity we will ever have in our lifetimes and in the lifetimes of the young that we've heard from. Thank you. Thanks. Now, Fad Vine, please. Uh... Brought up in this panel, uh, and never did I imagine when I first said, let's do something on COVID that it would turn out to be such a wonderful exchange of ideas. Um, but I remind you that we have a, a very big crisis and it's real, uh, a crisis in governance and leadership. Uh, the virus is ro romantically um, uh, looking at nature as if, if we are nice to nature everything would be fine. No, it is nature that's giving us a virus. And we, we will have many more germs because we always had germs. We will have bugs and we have viruses. And this is part of the natural evolutionary forces that put us on the planet. Yeah, I'm going but to also have a in our case, you have a final comment. A brain. Brain. But in the uh, yeah. case of the virus, we have a, a, a an organism that mutates all it has to all it wants is to survive and find a host now the challenge is for us not to say let's be nice to nature but rather are we ready because it will happen again and again and it's been happening for millions of years and in closing with, uh, I like what Winston said about uh, washing hands and rights, how washing hands in America and masking became a partisan issue. But you go to the Navajo community, which are closed in settlement, in, um, you know, reservations, uh, you tell them wash hands and they say, but you haven't given us running water yet after all these years, Navajos don't mm -hmm. have running water. So uh, let's think about both inequality, the power of this virus as an evolutionary um, presence. It's not a matter of loving nature and um, how uh, the cross-cultural aspect of how different groups interpret. Okay. Uh, thank you, Fatwa. One thing I've forgotten and uh, I mustn't forget is uh, to invite Emil to, to talk to us about the, some of the opportunities that might be for us as a group. I think our, much of our audience has dropped out. We are largely among ourselves now. And what our group uh, can do, perhaps, in co uh, collaboration with the Center of Excellence. Emil, if you're still there and hearing us, uh, please. Uh, uh, this is Juana. <laughs> this is Juana Brunda. Some of you may know me. I am working together with President Constantinescu on the project that uh, he was supposed to present to you. Uh, he had a recent uh, a call, uh, uh, a call from abroad that he had to take uh, so far. So with your permission, I will just talk briefly about the project to introduce it uh, in a few minutes. Just maybe. Just as good, well, Anna. That's good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, because I know we're a bit ahead of schedule and um, I don't want to keep you uh, more. Uh, so the project is entitled The World Post-COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, and we also have a small uh, slideshow that we can roll uh, so you can get familiar with what has been done so far. I cannot cover it all in just a few minutes. Um, 
And we will start the share screen right now to, to, to introduce you the project. So the, the project is called the World Post-COVID-19 Pandemic, a Humanist Vision for Sustainable Development. And we uh, thought about this project with the aim of um, gathering uh, multidisciplinary contributions, contributions coming from various fields of activity, from scholars, scientists, um, uh, or from all over the world in an effort to, to discuss the impact that the pandemic had on their fields of activity. At first, we thought that we should uh, think how will the world be like after the pandemic, but uh, month by month and uh, contribution by contribution, uh, we were still facing the pandemic. The number of cases was increasing. Uh, we had, uh, in, in summer, we had around uh, 10,000 cases per, uh, per day in Romania, which is a lot for 20 million people. Uh, so we thought of reconsidering the project and thinking uh, about how will the world look like during the pandemic and after the pandemic. So it's a sort of um, a combination between um, uh, present reality and foresight. Uh, and we've asked some of you who have already contributed, Padua contributed, um, uh, Stefan also contributed, and we're inviting you all, we're using this opportunity to invite you all to contribute with contributions on how you see the pandemic unfolding in your respective fields of, um, uh, of activity. Um, so there were some um, conclusions that we drawn so far. We received some of the, the contributions dealing with education, uh, dealing with uh, economy, um, um, environment protection, um, medicine, psychiatry. Stefan wrote to us about, uh, for instance, about um, the pandemic as a uh, systemic crisis and uh, also Fadwa wrote to us about the impact uh, from an anthropological point of view and she um, highlighted uh, the need of preserving our humanness not just our humanity but our humanness and we highly appreciated uh, this uh, this uh, move uh, from uh, humanity to humanness uh, so the, the findings that we, um, um, we, we got to were the fact that um, the pandemic took the spotlight of all the news and of all the events and uh, several other pro problems such as migration, such as uh, the protection of human rights, such as um, uh, political issues, we've had wars, we've had tensions going on, uh, have been left in the background and unfortunately um, uh, they, they grew in intensity. Also, um, uh, there was another finding that we got to uh, that uh, focused on the need to, to look at the pandemic uh, from this uh, holistic uh, perspective, taking into account um, not just uh, specific fields, but also the way these fields are integrated into the bigger picture. Um, this, is, um, this, uh, this platform will be translated into a book very soon. We are working on that. And we will be um, collating all the contributions into a volume that will aim to um, present not just specialists because uh, we're having opinions from experts in their field of activity, but we also, um, we also uh, want to address the layman, people who are not specialists in the field of medicine, education, but have dealt with the um, outcome <laughs> of the pandemic uh, from a personal point of view, either their dear ones were affected, their, uh, their children, had to go online and had to, um, or probably were deprived of uh, a quality education because of lack of appropriate technology and so on and so forth. We also um, approach the issue of sustainable development as you have seen it in the, in the title, because this is an issue that needs to be tackled all the more. Uh, although we had uh, a major impact on fields such as uh, healthcare, which was the most affected, followed by economy, followed by uh, education, and so on. Uh, but uh, we we um, aim to to use this project um, and turn it into this book that I mentioned to to provide an overall view that could. Um, Familiarize us all. Familiarize us all with uh, which is the the, the largest context, the, the larger context in which the pandemic occurred, and uh, how we will have to uh, work 
um, uh, and um, uh, find solutions to rebuild our uh, lives post uh, post pandemic. Uh, this was a short slideshow with all the with some of the contributions actually that we've received. Some of them are still being translated because we have a bilingual platform, a Romanian and English version. Um, we're still um, uh, we still have some contributions uh, waiting to be posted, uh, and we're looking forward to to your contribution as well uh, because we believe that this is um, the next step that could be could be taken in approaching the pandemic we we all heard people uh, complaining about the uh, lack of uh, supplies the the lack of procedures we are not aiming to produce here recommendations for um, for uh, for those respective fields although we had in mind this uh, this idea but um, we're trying to provide a pattern of response that can be adapted uh, based on the on the fields of um, on the fields of activity and also on the uh, personal perspective on uh, on the pandemic because as President Constantinescu mentioned earlier the pandemic is first and foremost about the people which make governments which make the state which makes various industries but if the people are affected the, the respective industries are bound to be affected as well and collapse so we need to focus on the people and this is uh, somehow the central piece of our um, our project thank you okay. very much for, uh, <laughs> for the attention thomas and for thank the, you so uh, much Oana. good to see you face we've been communicating for a while i haven't uh, yeah. seen you yet and we'll stay in touch and we'll look at possibilities for contributing and, and talk about formats. Uh, in, in any case, uh, we'll stay in touch and we'll, we'll, we'll explore that and uh, I'll, I'll, I can relay the information to the group. And I would ask you, Juana, and, and, and everyone on the panel also to please share uh, the link to the uh, Facebook recording of this session and put it on your websites, your, your own LinkedIn and Facebook or whatever. And uh, perhaps uh, I would like to ask our wonderful technical support team to send the link to that Facebook recording to this group. I think you, you have all, all the emails and, and thank you for all your support throughout this panel. Thank you all for your contributions. Uh, it's been very, very rich and varied uh, spectrum of, of opinions and insights. And I hope we can uh, find uh, good ways to, to uh, perhaps publish some of that or uh, you know, have shorter interviews uh, or clips from the recording for websites. And we'll, we'll explore that in the aftermath of the panel. Thank you very much.